The material symmetry requirements on the elastic moduli for linear elasticity can also be given an energetic viewpoint. So I'd like to go through that briefly. So the, the definition in the energetic viewpoint says given Q orthogonal, Q is an element of the material symmetry group, which I'm going to call G, uh, if and only if the free energy for a given value of strain is equal to the free energy when I apply the orthogonal transformation to that state of strain for all values of strain. So, in other words, the free energy for a strain epsilon is equal to the free energy when I pre and post multiply that same epsilon by Q, an element of my symmetry group. So if I have this situation, that's what I mean by uh, material symmetry. And what I'd like to look at is the consequences of this. And what we'll see is that we get the same result that we had before. But conceptually, what you can think of here is that I, I have a material, and say I'm looking at a point and I apply a strain. Let's say it's a uniaxial strain, so epsilon n outer product n, where n is some direction that I'm applying the uniaxial strain in. And I'm going to compute some value of the free energy. Now, if I consider epsilon hat, which is epsilon q n outer product n q transpose, so I'm essentially applying q on the front and q transpose on the back to my original epsilon up here. I'm going to compute a new value of the free energy out of that strain. I'll call that psi hat. And the material symmetry requirement tells me that psi is equal to psi hat. So only in the situation where psi equals psi hat uh, do I have an element of the material symmetry group. So pictorially what I have here is I'm applying say the uniaxial strain in one direction and now I apply it in a different direction and what I'm saying is is that for elements of the material symmetry group the free energy density that I'm going to get from uniaxial strain in the n direction and uniaxial strain in the qn direction they're going to be the same. So, written out in initial form, I'm going to have 1 half epsilon ij, cij kl, epsilon kl is equal to 1 half qpi, epsilon ij, qj. So that is the application of qq transpose to epsilon. Then I'll have cpqrs, and then I'll have qrk, epsilon kl, qsl. And this needs to hold for all strains epsilon. Okay, and in all these expressions, all the components here are given in a given coordinate basis, let's say E1, E2, E3. Now, I can, uh, this has to hold true for all epsilon, so that tells me that Cijkl is equal to Qpi, Qj, Qrk, Qsl, Qpqrs. Okay? And again, this is, every component here is given in a given basis. Now, recall from before that if I have an orthogonal tensor, I can represent it in terms of my original basis and a new basis, which we'll call a star basis, via this expression. So EI, tensor outer product, EI star. So the star is a new basis, and the Q can always be written down in this form. And we also have these other results that qj star is equal to qj i e i and e i star is equal to q transpose e i. So we had those from before. And again, the components here for qj i are the components of the tensor q in the original basis, the unstarred basis. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to move these Q's to the other side of the expression. I'll do that by multiplying through by Q transpose. So if I'll, I'll multiply through by Q transpose IP bar, Q transpose JQ bar, Q transpose KR bar, Q transpose LS bar. And so when I do that on the right hand side here, for instance, I'll, I'll, I'll have a Q transpose IP bar, which will generate a Kronecker delta P 
P, P bar for me. And that thus, that will take then this first P here and turn it into a P bar. And if I do that for each Q there, I'm going to end up with the barred quantities now. So C, P bar, Q bar, R bar, S bar. And again, all the components here are in the original basis, the EI basis without the stars. Okay, now let's observe one additional important fact, and that is that if I look at Q transpose IP bar, let's say times a vector set of components EI, well, I can expand the Q transpose IP bar. That's EP bar star dotted with EI multiplied by my component. But if I look at these two terms here, that just simply gives me my vector. So this combination of terms here really is like taking my vector and applying the star basis vector to it. So what I have down here is then if I look at the I and, and the Q transpose IP bar, that's like applying EP star to the tensor C in its sort of first argument, let's say. And this will be like applying EQ star to the second argument of C, etc. So if I write that all out, what I see is that on the left-hand side, I have EP star outer product EQ star double contract with C acting on ER star outer product ES star. So that's my left-hand side. And I've dropped the bars here on the PQRS just to reduce the writing. And then on the right-hand side here, I just simply have the components of C. And remember, in my calculation here, all the components are always in the unstarred basis. So on the right-hand side, I have EP outer product EQ double contracted with C acting on ER outer product ES. And recall here that uh, the Q, the symmetry element, is written out in this special form EI outer product EI star. So, but now the technical details aside, what I end up with is this important relationship here that imposes a restriction on the possible values that the components of the elasticity tensor can take.